I don't know about you, but I could spend another whole day or a week even looking at some of those ideas, concepts that Robin just outlined. And I think it's worth exploring. What I'm going to do is give you a, a rather rapid fire description of some of the threats that now face uh, the idea of national sovereignty the concept of the nation state. Now, I, I spent some years in finance, then as a financial journalist, then I worked for several multilateral organizations, bureaucracies, and now I edit and publish this journal, European Conservative, and website. So my comments are drawn from that diversity of experiences. Uh, like I said, th this concept, this idea of national sovereignty, for me is personally fascinating and you can trace back discussions of what sovereignty is to, to the Middle Ages. There's some uh, very important, very long texts from the scholastic period. <clears throat> um, I think Robin has given you the, the beginnings uh, of, of, of how to approach this concept, this idea. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, one might even look at the root word of sovereignty, look at the sovereign, what, who, what, what does the sovereign look like, what does he or she look like. If, if you really want to be controversial, you can look at Carl Schmitt, the Roman Catholic uh, political philosopher, who uh, famously wrote in the beginning of his 1922 book, Political Theology, the following, um, I think it's the opening, opening line, sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. A lot to unpack there, um, but this session in my talk is not the time or the place. Maybe afterwards, maybe this evening over a, a glass of wine. Like I said, what I wanna do is look at some of the threats facing national sovereignty. Um, remember though, <clears throat> let me, let me under, underscore one thing, uh, that sovereign states, uh, the idea of national sovereignty is foundational to international order. There is no political order without sovereign states. And what's interesting, uh, and I think a lot of people have forgotten this, is that since World War II, the key institutions of what would eventually become part of the liberal international order acknowledged that state sovereignty was essential to the preservation of peace and the promotion of prosperity. So think of the founding charter of the United Nations, which states that it is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all its members. That's the UN. Look at the international financial institutions, the, 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 the entities that were created under the Bretton Woods Conference. Um, they also recognized and, and respected the idea of sovereign states. NATO too. Um, it is sovereign states, member states of NATO, that form the basis of its agreements and obligations. And even the EU, it's, it's incredible to say this today, but even the EU in the beginning um, was founded on a series of treaties between nation states with an explicit recognition of national sovereignty beginning with the 1957 Treaty of Rome. Clearly something's changed. I, I've just described the UN and the EU and the, the uh, multilateral bureaucracies out of Bretton Woods as defending national sovereignty. That was a long time ago. Things have changed. Now even some of those very institutions are part of the threat to national sovereignty. So let me get into the, the threats and I've, I've, I've I've organized them in, in, in very rough categories of external and internal threats. You might disagree with my categorization, we can discuss that, but let me start with external threats to national sovereignty. Some of these can be considered uh, explicit uh, or, or very clear threats to national security. And national security, of course, involves a national government working autonomously successfully to protect its citizens from all threats. 
So anything that threatens the physical well-being of the citizens of a nation state, of a given population, of a, of a given political community, anything that jeopardizes the stability of that nation's economy or its institutions is a national security threat and a threat to national sovereignty. Let me break down these threats even further. So, of course, there's obviously hostile governments, clear threat to national security. That's the most obvious. We have plenty of examples. Um, they can include acts of war, of course, or they can include espionage, election interference. These are obvious. But there's also transnational threats, and I, I'm especially intrigued by these, and, and these can take a variety of forms. What are transnational threats? Well, let me begin with the, um, what I might call the, the least formal of these transnational threats, which are criminal networks. So the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the U.S. defines transnational criminal groups as groups that seek their own power, influence, or financial gains through, obviously, illegal activities. That's why they're criminal, regardless of physical geography. They work across boundaries, they violate the laws of one or multiple nations, and they, because of this, they pose a threat to a variety or a, a, a group of nation states. So some examples of these transnational criminal networks, uh, MS-13, have you ever heard of them? Mara Salvatrucha 13, it's a Central American criminal gang. You, you've seen them in the news, they're completely covered in tattoos, skulls and things. That's, it sounds like a joke, but it's a very serious threat in the United States. And different regions of the world have their own criminal networks and gangs. Anyone involved in the illicit trade of, well, the illicit commodity trade, like cocaine and drugs also, these are transnational threats. There's also, moving beyond the criminal networks, there are Transnational elite networks. Now, the, these are harder to see, and very few people write about them. When they do write about them, they're dismissed as crazy people. Because we're talking about the, the transnational elite networks that exist and operate on a variety of continents at different levels. What I'm talking about is um, former intelligence officials, former defense ministers, etc., and they form part of private associations and clubs, and they meet regularly, and they discuss things. They discuss the problems of the world. They discuss how things should operate. And they're not beholden any longer to the national interests of their countries. They're operating in a transnational elite level. Some of these groups are conservative, meaning we could probably sympathize with them. Others have progressive, radical left ideas and objectives. In either case, I think they serve to subtly undermine the power and integrity of the nation state. And they seek to influence foreign policy, domestic policy, and as such, they are a threat, again, to national sovereignty. Some examples, uh, and, I, and I say this uh, uh, reluctantly because uh, the moment I mention these, you, you'll think I'm part of some extreme fringe. I'm just describing them as a journalist. The Council on Foreign Relations, the Atlantic Council, these are not secretive, these are open, but they operate in this way. Then there's the Trilateral Commission, and someone the other day was talking to me about Masonic networks. So you, you know these arguments, you know, the, these are long. I don't dismiss them, but I also hesitate to give them too much importance. I mention them to you because they're part of the constellation of threats to national sovereignty. Another transnational threat, of course, is immigration, legal or illegal in all its forms, not just one kind. But immigration, uncontrolled especially, undermines, as you know, the customs, the values, the traditions, and the stability of a particular country, especially in rural and small communities. In, in, in the United States, there's the example of Afghan refugees being placed by the federal government in little towns in northeastern United States. Little towns with 100 or 200 people suddenly receive 20 Afghan refugees. You know, th these have effects that have to be thought about. So control over borders, the power of sovereignty that such control represents, has always represented a central element of state power.
An essential element of a state's power has always been tied to a state's ability to control and defend its territorial integrity. All right, moving on to something a little bit more abstract. Globalization, the process of globalization, can be considered a threat to national sovereignty. It erodes national sovereignty through a variety of, of, of mechanisms or means and helps diminish the power of governments. Globalization facilitates the ability of international companies, corporations, multinational corporations, to set the economic and often political agenda of different countries. I mean, the, the flows of FDI, foreign direct investment, the flows of portfolio investments are so massive that they easily distort uh, national interests. They easily change what politicians in a recipient country should be doing. I have the example of something called Fidelity Investments. Fidelity Investments is an investment fund in Boston, Massachusetts. No one's really heard of them, but they have more than $1.5 trillion under management that they invest. So when they go to a, a country in Europe, they, they get attention. Immediately, the ministers of finance of Spain or France or another country receive them with open arms because $1.5 trillion is quite a bit of money. And in that way, they have an influence on the domestic policies, on the economic policies of those recipient countries. Um, all this raises intriguing and, 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 and difficult questions. And while I have no answers, much like Robin, I think we're answerless men. Uh, I think it's worth discussing, uh, especially when you, when you think in terms of the national interests of Croatia or your own country, wherever that might be. Now, let's move on to more substantial, perhaps you could say more sophisticated threats to national sovereignty. These are the ones that most people think of when we talk about threats to national sovereignty. First, there are the supranational or multilateral governance structures. The EU is, is what we most have in mind. And, and numerous books over the last five or 10 years have really focused on, on the problems of the EU, how far it's moved away from its original founding vision by the founding fathers, and, and what's been going on in Brussels and Strasbourg and, 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 and within the whole EU apparatus. Uh, there are many books I can recommend. I'm happy to send you a, a two-page um, bibliography of some of these books. But one of the best, but hardest to find, is written by Princess Ingrid Detter de Franco Pan. Uh, it's called Suicide of Europe, and it's, uh, she's a lawyer. Um, it's it's written like a legal brief, methodically outlining everything the EU and its appendages does to undermine national sovereignty. Vaclav Klaus, of course, also of the Czech Republic, has written Europe, The Shattering of Illusions. And like I said, I have a two-page list of these books, happy to share with you. Now, there's, there's no doubt that the EU and the EU elites sincerely believe in this idea of multilateralism, in, the, in the, 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 the idea of moving away from national interests. Uh, according to Todd Huizinga, another author of a book I'd recommend, the book is The New Totalitarian Temptation, Global Governance and the Crisis of Democracy in Europe. Todd Huizinga says that at its core, the EU cannot be but a sworn enemy to democratic sovereignty. Pretty harsh, pretty strong words there. But I don't think he's wrong. The worldview of a multilateral entity such as the EU is today profoundly different from that of the nation state. It may have been similar decades ago, as I said in the very beginning. Today, it is wholly alien. For one, the EU seems to think that human nature is malleable, that through the right educational programs and the right regulations, it can transform the human being much like the Soviets thought they could too. The EU favors a transformative and I would say emancipatory 
approach that seeks to reconstruct human nature and liberate human beings from the constraints of family, tradition, custom, society. In short, I would say the EU's transnational progressive agenda seeks to expand a supranational authority that promotes the concept of an autonomous, atomized individual, and they do this through a variety of ways and through the promotion of radical feminism, LGBT rights, and children's rights, which children's rights, of course, are anti-parental rights. The other group of these threats, these external threats, are the the multilateral bureaucracies now represented by things like the IMF, the World Bank, the two main Bretton Woods entities, also OPEC, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, the UN, and there's dozens and dozens more. In some cases, these multilateral bureaucracies supersede uh, or determine at the national level economic and financial policies for a given country. It's the famed IMF conditionality. In order to receive our money or our credits, you have to do this. I think that's called blackmail in, in, uh, in other places. They also can control the production levels of certain things. I'm, I have in mind OPEC, which controls through its secretariat the production levels of petroleum. Now, based on my experiences at several of these multilateral bureaucracies, I have to point out the following. And I'm not telling you this so that you can get a job at the World Bank or the IMF or OPEC, but this is what the people who work in these organizations have. They have tax-free salaries. They have generous stipends for living and housing, for medical care, for moving from one city to another. For each child, they get additional money, another credit. If they're married, they get another credit. They get credits for education. They get maternal and paternal leave, all tax-free. So what do you think happens to human beings who are working at these organizations? As we say, I think, in the United States, it goes to their head. They start becoming conceited. It feeds their arrogance. They begin to feel part of a global cosmocracy. And it's, in a sense, they are. The people who work at these multilateral bureaucracies are a class of global citizens, unrooted, disconnected from any allegiance to any given state. And they're disconnected through their tax-free status from the real socioeconomic realities that most of us have to live with. There, was a, there is a magazine in Britain called Prospect. It's, it's not conservative, but it's a very fair-minded uh, magazine. Their former editor, David Goodhart, has written about this division between these global, this global aristocracy. He calls them the anywheres, because they can live anywhere. They can be in Milan or London or Tokyo, and because they live in this bubble, this tax-free bubble, and all the accoutrement that accompanies them and all their perks, they have not, that, like I said, no allegiance, no roots. And they're distinguished from what David Goodhart calls the somewheres. That's, that's us, most of us in this room. We're rooted to a particular time, a community, a town, a village, a place, a city, a country. That, that division between anywheres and somewheres is one of the defining struggles of our day. And like I said, I've already said this, but if there's one trait that defines those anywheres, it's arrogance or hubris, if you prefer the Greek word. So I, I used to think those traits, this arrogance, was endemic to just these organizations, but it's actually a mindset that arises across many spheres of human activity. Um, I recently had a chance to start reading some of the progressive literature of the early 20th century. I'm talking Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and other global leaders of around the early 20th century. And what comes through in their speeches <clears throat> and their articles and essays is, again, this arrogance. Because as Wilson and FDR and others continually say, well, 
we, we know better because we went to university and we know what is best for people. And what we need is to develop a, a, an expert class, a, a class of experts from the best universities around the world who can then determine how each country should do its work and what kind of policies and regulations are needed. We need to find the smartest people and we need to have them working in the government. I find that repugnant. Um, <clears throat> there's much more I can say about this nebulous world, this, this semi-attractive world of the multilaterals, but let me just mention one more thing. Emerging out of all these bureaucracies and all these multilateral entities, of course, are a series of regulations and treaties and accords, agreements. And of course, uh, I think one of the most obvious examples was the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And everything that flows out of that, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and the COP, the Conference of the Parties, which is the supreme decision-making body determining how we're all going to live carbon-free lives. There have been 26 of these COP meetings, by the way. The next one will be uh, in November in Egypt. 20, so it'll, by November, it'll be 27 meetings of all these elite bureaucrats and negotiators from all these different countries, all determining for us how we're going to live, what our companies are going to have to do to cut their emissions, etc. Uh, it's, it's, I find it disgusting, and, and I, I can say that with more vehemence now, having been inside some of these boondoggles. Enough about external threats. A, a few brief remarks on what I consider internal threats to national sovereignty. These, these are harder to classify. They're, 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 and, 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 and in, in some ways, these are my impressions, so bear with me, please. Um, first, I, I, think there, I think it's clear that in, in many countries there is an erosion of the teaching of what we used to call in the old days civics, uh, lessons in citizenship. Uh, I don't know of schools that really teach this content anymore. I, I, I don't know if it's an unwillingness or an inability to teach civics and what it means to be a citizen. But what, it, what, what we're seeing is that young people are coming out of elementary schools and universities ill-equipped, completely ill-equipped to participate as responsible members of their political community, of their polity. Going further, it, it's not only that they're ill-equipped, but in some countries they're, they're aggressively against their own political community. In the UK, in the US, in a lot of the Anglosphere countries, you have young people who are arguing against the foundations of their country, saying that the foundations or the origins are illegitimate because they're racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever. Of course, complicit in this are the world's elite universities, all corrupt, by the way. Oxbridge, Harvard, the College of Europe, and so many others, completely taken over by the radical left, producing students that are enemies to their own nation states, that are enemies or threats to national sovereignty. In fact, some of these elite, well, most of these elite universities are now producing what? the future ruling class. As Woodrow Wilson and FDR and others said, they're producing the future technocrats that will eventually tell you or your children and grandchildren how to live. Third, I, I also think that there is something to be said about the demise or the destruction or disappearance of voluntary associations in different countries. I, I, you know, scouting, for example, the Boy Scouts, in the United States and in other countries was a vibrant thing 40, 50, 80 years ago. It produced good citizens, patriotic citizens, people with allegiance to their country. I don't see scouts anymore, anywhere, except maybe France. 
I, it, it seems like a silly thing to mention, but I think the disappearance of these kinds of clubs and voluntary associations, especially for the young, leads to an erosion of this idea of citizenship, which, again, I think is a threat, an internal threat to this idea of national sovereignty. Fourth, uh, and at an even more perhaps abstract level, I have to mention the internet. Now, I'm not against technology. I'm not a, in England they had the, the Luddite movement that saw technology, and technological advancement as a, as a threat. Uh, I'm not arguing against the internet, but I think if we analyze and consider things carefully, and if you look at how young people are spending more and more time online, with an online existence, interacting more online than face to face, you have to wonder whether or not there are cognitive and psychological effects on those young people. And how will they be then good citizens? How will they be part of a real actual community? Will they be able to attend a town meeting and get together in a room like this and interact? Or are they gonna be completely incapable of talking to a young woman next to them? I think these are all forms of threats. And, and if you think I'm just talking uh, nonsense here, there are studies that talk about the effects of technology and television on the development of citizenship. The, I think the classic work is Giovanni Sartori's book, I think in the mid-90s, Homo Videns, not Homo Ludens or, or Homo Sapiens, but Homo videns, which the viewing man, the man, the person who is raised on a daily diet of image, images from the television, from the computer, and what effect that has on that person's self-understanding as a member of a political community. Highly recommended book. I think all this stuff has to be thinking, thought about. How human beings interact with their surroundings, how they interact with each other, and how they conceive of themselves as a member of a community. Finally, there are other ongoing attempts to undermine the national sovereignty of countries through uh, think tanks, research centers, and again, these quasi-academic kind of studies that are always being published and being pushed by, often with, with, with the help of EU funding. I have two examples, two quick examples, and then I can wrap up. Uh, the Jacques Delors Institute, named after the famous socialist, French um, president of the European Commission, uh, has issued several reports. One of, the, one of the most recent has warned of too much national sovereignty, dangerous. And they say that uh, national sovereignty and movements promoting national sovereignty, sovereignty uh, lead to an ineffective and perilous, dangerous gamble of going back to the Europe of the past. The Europe of the past, I, I'm, I, I, I don't see what the danger was in a Europe of the past, if by that we mean national sovereignty, sovereignty and a balance of powers. Uh, while, the, while this Jacques Delors Institute admits that the EU faces major challenges, financial, economic, security, it calls for, it calls, excuse me, the Jacques Delors Institute calls, quote, the worrying rise in populism as a, one of the most urgent threats to EU stability. You got that? So anyone who is a patriot, who's a sovereigntist, who believes in national sovereignty, is a direct threat to the EU. All right. The other example I have was from a recent conference at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, and I found this very uh, interesting. It's, it was funded by the EU and three other uh, organizations, all in Brussels. And uh, it was... It, it was a one-day seminar on four fallacies of deliberation. Now, there's a lot of words I'm, I'm, I'm going to read here, so bear with me. It's all jargon. It's, 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 it's how they keep us from really understanding what's going on. But let me just read a few excerpts from the abstracts of some of the presentations at this conference. The first says, 
Uh, it is a mistake to suggest that a decision made by ordinary citizens is better. Okay. In other words, experts know more. Ordinary citizens are not better. They don't know anything. We have to listen to the experts, not the citizens. That was a 90-minute presentation by an academic. Here's another one. That there is a misperception that deliberative processes have higher legitimacy. Misperception that deliberative processes have higher legitimacy. So that increased or broader deliberation with ordinary citizens is somehow less legitimate than what? than a council in Brussels meeting and deciding things for us. That's obviously the other side, the, the, the part that's left unsaid. And here's a third example. This one really, really uh, amuses and, and alarms me. This presentation said that the growing forms of deliberation implemented in hybrid and authoritarian environments can play a role in legitimating non-democratic regimes. Can you follow that? It's, uh, it's saying that even if a given country says that they're gonna increase citizen participation and have a broad deliberative process, that in doing so, that is legitimating an authoritarian regime. In other words, that's a direct, directly aimed at, at Orban. Because it's saying even though Orban is allowing for the public expression of views and citizen participation, it's all a tool to legitimate his regime. You, you see, so no matter what you do, if you're on the wrong political side of things, everything you do will be seen as a threat, a tool. Anyway, I've gone on too long about that, but those were just examples of how these quasi-academic institutions and seminars and conferences subtly produce uh, the idea that national so sovereignty uh, is bad, it subtly undermine the idea of national sovereignty. All right, so final comments. The future, well, <laughs> who knows? Um, what's clear is this idea of national sovereignty, the idea of the nation state continues to be fragile, delicate, precarious, precious, and as our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers knew, was worthy of sacrifice. I, and I think people are slowly beginning to wake up or reawaken to this idea. Uh, I, I might, this afternoon in the session on the future of conservatism, I might talk more about this great awakening that is, I think, beginning to take place. Uh, these debates, these discussions are happening more and more. Um, here, here in Europe, there's great hope in places like Hungary, Croatia, Poland, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Middle Europa. It's all very good, and these discussions have to take place. Um, at the same time, in those places that are having these discussions, that have not been prevented from talking about these things, maybe these are the places that we should be forming alliances with, or having greater and greater connections with. We need to be working more and more together. 15 years ago when I came to Europe, French conservatives didn't want to work with Italian conservatives and they didn't want to meet the Spanish conservatives. That's all changing. We need to be working across borders together. Let me end by quoting the future Prime Minister of Italy, Meloni, who uh, two years ago at uh, the National Conservatism Conference in Rome said the following, Quote, we did not fight against and defeat communism in order to replace it with a new internationalist regime. We fought to permit independent nation states once again to defend the freedom, identity, and sovereign sovereignty of their peoples, end quote. So I, I wholly agree with that, and I suppose we're, we're all sovereignists now. Uh, thank you, and... Uh, We'll take questions after John speaks.